Chapter 14 478 Observed, however, that he was a sturdily built man, but not very tall in stature. Over his armor he wore a surcoat or cassock of what seemed to be the finest cloth of gold, all bespangled with glittering mirrors like little moons, which gave him an extremely gallant and splendid appearance. Above his helmet fluttered a great quantity of plumes, green, yellow and white, and his lance, which was leaning against a tree, was very long and stout, and had a steel point more than a palm in length. Don Quixote observed all, and took note of all, and from what he saw and observed he concluded that the said knight must be a man of great strength, but he did not for all that give way to fear, like Sancho Panza, on the contrary, with a composed and dauntless air, he said to the knight of the mirrors, if, sir knight, your great eagerness to fight has not banished your courtesy, by it I would entreat you to raise your visor a little, in order that I may see if the comeliness of your countenance corresponds with that of your equipment. Whether you come victorious or vanquished out of this emprise, sir knight, replied he of the mirrors, you will have more than enough time and leisure to see me, and if now I do not comply with your request, it is because it seems to me I should do a serious wrong to the fair Casildia de Vandalia in wasting time while I stop to raise my visor before compelling you to confess what you are already aware I maintain. Well then, said Don Quixote, while we are mounting you can at least tell me if I am the Don Quixote whom you said you vanquished. To that we answer you, said he of the mirrors, that you are as like the very knight I vanquished as one egg is like another, but as you say enchanters persecute you, I will not venture to say positively whether you are the said person or not. That, said Don Quixote, is enough to convince me that you are under a deception, however, entirely to relieve you of it, let our horses be brought, and in less time than it would take you to raise your visor, if God, my lady, and my arm stand me in good stead, I shall see your face, and you shall see that I am not the vanquished Don Quixote you take me to be. With this, cutting short the colloquy, they mounted, and Don Quixote wheeled Rocinante round in order to take a proper distance to charge back upon his adversary, and he of the mirrors did the same but Don Quixote had not moved away twenty paces when he heard himself called by the other, and, each returning half minus way, he of the mirror said to him, Remember, Sir Knight, that the terms of our combat are, that the vanquished, as I said before, shall be at the victor's disposal. I am aware of it already, said Don Quixote, provided what is commanded and imposed upon the vanquished be things that do not transgress the limits of chivalry. Don Quixote Chapter 14 479 that is understood, replied he of the mirrors. At this moment the extraordinary nose of the squire presented itself to Don Quixote's view, and he was no less amazed than Sancho at the sight, insomuch that he set him down as a monster of some kind, or a human being of some new species or unearthly breed. Sancho, seeing his master retiring to run his course, did not like to be left alone with the nosy man, fearing that with one flap of that nose on his own the battle would be all over for him and he would be left stretched on the ground, either by the blow or with fright. So he ran after his master, holding on to Rocinante's stirrup minus leather, and when it seemed to him time to turn about he said, I implore of your worship, senor, before you turn to charge, to help me up into this cork tree, from which I will be able to witness the gallant encounter your worship is going to have with this knight, more to my taste and better than from the ground. It seems to me rather, Sancho, said Don Quixote, that thou wouldst mount a scaffold in order to see the bulls without danger. To tell the truth, returned Sancho, the monstrous nose of that squire has filled me with fear and terror, and I dare not stay near him. It is, said Don Quixote, such a one that were I not what I am it would terrify me too, so, come, I will help thee up where thou wilt. While Don Quixote waited for Sancho to mount into the cork tree he of the mirrors took as much ground as he considered requisite, and, supposing Don Quixote to have done the same, without waiting for any sound of trumpet or other signal to direct them, he wheeled his horse, which was not more agile or better minus looking than Rocinante, and at his top speed, which was an easy trot, he proceeded to charge his enemy, seeing him, however, engaged in putting Sancho up, he drew rein and halted in mid-career, for which his horse was very grateful, as he was already unable to go. Don Quixote, fancying that his foe was coming down upon him flying, drove his spurs vigorously into Rocinante's lean flanks and made him scud along in such style that the history tells us that on this occasion only was he known to make something like running, for on all others it was a simple trot with him, and with this unparalleled fury he bore down where he of the mirrors stood digging his spurs into his horse up to buttons without being able to make him stir a finger's length from the spot where he had come to a standstill in his course.
At this lucky moment in crisis, Don Quixote came upon his adversary, in trouble with his horse, and embarrassed with his lance, which he either could not manage, or had no time to lay in rest. Don Quixote however paid no attention to these difficulties, and in perfect safety to himself, and without any risk encountered him of the mirrors with such force that he brought him to the ground in spite of himself over the haunches of his horse, and with so heavy a fall that he lay to all appearance dead, not stirring hand or foot. The instant Sancho saw him fall he slid down from the cork tree, and made all haste to where his master was, who, dismounting from Rocinante, went and stood over him of the mirrors, and unlacing his helmet to see if he was dead, and to give. Don Quixote Chapter 14 480 Himer if he should happen to be alive, he saw Minus who can say what he saw, without filling all who hear it with astonishment, wonder, and awe. He saw, the history says, the very countenance, the very face, the very look, the very physiognomy, the very effigy, the very image of the bachelor Samson Carrasco. As soon as he saw it he called out in a loud voice, Make haste here, Sancho, and behold what thou art to see, but not to believe, quick, my son, and learn what magic can do, and wizards and enchanters are capable of. Sancho came up, and when he saw the countenance of the bachelor Carrasco, he fell to crossing himself a thousand times, and blessing himself as many more. All this time the prostrate knight showed no signs of life, and Sancho said to Don Quixote, It is my opinion, senor, that in any case your worship should take and thrust your sword into the mouth of this one here that looks like the bachelor Samson Carrasco, perhaps in him you will kill one of your enemies, the enchanters. Thy advice is not bad, said Don Quixote, for of enemies the fewer the better, and he was drawing his sword to carry into effect Sancho's counsel and suggestion, when the squire of the mirrors came up, now without the nose which had made him so hideous, and cried out in a loud voice, Mind what you are about, Senor Don Quixote, that is your friend, the bachelor Samson Carrasco, you have at your feet, and I am his squire. And the nose, said Sancho, seeing him without the hideous feature he had before, to which he replied, I have it here in my pocket, and putting his hand into his right pocket, he pulled out a masquerade nose of varnished pasteboard of the make already described, and Sancho, examining him more and more closely, exclaimed aloud in a voice of amazement, Holy Mary be good to me. Isn't it Tom Seashell, my neighbor in gossip? Why, to be sure I am, returned the now unnosed squire, Tom Seashell I am, gossip and friend Sancho Panza, and I'll tell you presently the means and tricks and falsehoods by which I have been brought here but in the meantime, beg and entreat of your master not to touch, maltreat, wound, or slay the knight of the mirrors whom he has at his feet, because, beyond all dispute, it is the rash and ill-minus advised bachelor Samson Carrasco, our fellow townsman. At this moment he of the mirrors came to himself, and Don Quixote perceiving it, held the naked point of his sword over his face, and said to him, You are a dead man, knight, unless you confess that the peerless Dulcinea del Toboso excels your Casildia de Vandalia in beauty and in addition to this you must promise, if you should survive this encounter and fall, to go to the city of El Toboso, and present yourself before her on my behalf, that she deal with you according to her good pleasure, and if she leaves you free to do yours, you are in like manner to return and seek me out, for the trail of my mighty deeds will serve you as a guide to lead you to where I may be, and tell me what may have passed between you and her minus conditions which, in accordance with what we stipulated before our combat, do not transgress the just limits of night minus errantry. Don Quixote Chapter 14 481 I confess, said the fallen knight, that the dirty tattered shoe of the Lady Dulcinea del Toboso is better than the ill minus comb though clean beard of Casildia, and I promise to go and to return from her presence to yours and to give you a full and particular account of all you demand of me. You must also confess and believe, added Don Quixote, that the knight you vanquished was not and could not be Don Quixote of La Mancha, but someone else in his likeness, just as I confess and believe that you, though you seem to be the bachelor Samson Carrasco, are not so, but some other resembling him, whom my enemies have here put before me in his shape, in order that I may restrain and moderate the vehemence of my wrath, and make a gentle use of the glory of my victory. I confess, hold, and think everything to be as you believe, hold, and think it, the crippled knight. Let me rise, I entreat you, if indeed, the shock of my fall will allow me, for it has left me in a sorry plight enough. Don Quixote helped him to rise, with the assistance of his squire Tom Seashell, from whom Sancho never took his eyes, and to whom he put questions, the replies to which furnished clear proof that he was really and truly the Tom Seashell he said, but the impression made on Sancho's mind by what his master said about the enchanters having changed the face of the Knight of the Mirrors into that of the bachelor Samson Carrasco, would not permit him to believe what he saw with his eyes. 
In fine, both master and man remained under the delusion, and, down in the mouth, and out of luck, he of the mirrors and his squire parted from Don Quixote and Sancho, he meaning to go look for some village where he could plaster and strap his ribs. Don Quixote and Sancho resumed their journey to Saragossa, and on it the history leaves them in order that it may tell who the knight of the mirrors and his long minus nosed squire were. Don Quixote Chapter 14 482 Chapter 15 Wherein it is told and known who the knight of the Mirrors and his squire were Don Quixote went off satisfied, elated, and vain minus glorious in the highest degree at having won a victory over such a valiant knight as he fancied him of the mirrors to be, and one from whose knightly word he expected to learn whether the enchantment of his lady still continued, inasmuch as the said vanquished knight was bound, under the penalty of ceasing to be won, to return and render him an account of what took place between him and her. But Don Quixote was of one mind, he of the mirrors of another, for he just then had no thought of anything but finding some village where he could plaster himself, as has been said already. The history goes on to say, then, that when the bachelor Samson Carrasco recommended Don Quixote to resume his knight minus errantry which he had laid aside, it was in consequence of having been previously in conclave with the curate and the barber on the means to be adopted to induce Don Quixote to stay at home in peace and quiet without. Worrying himself with his ill-minus start adventures, at which consultation it was decided by the unanimous vote of all, and on the special advice of Carrasco, that Don Quixote should be allowed to go, as it seemed impossible to restrain him, and that Samson should sally forth to meet him as a knight minus errant, and do battle with him, for there would be no difficulty about a cause, and vanquish him, that being looked upon as an easy matter, and that it should be agreed and settled that the vanquished was to be at the mercy of the victor. Then, Don Quixote being vanquished, the bachelor knight was to command him to return to his village, and his house, and not quit it for two years, or until he received further orders from him all which it was clear Don Quixote would unhesitatingly obey, rather than contravene or fail to observe the laws of chivalry, and during the period of his seclusion he might perhaps forget his folly, or there might be an opportunity of discovering some ready remedy for his madness. Carrasco undertook the task and Tom Seashell, a gossip and neighbor of Sancho. Panzas, a lively, feather-headed fellow, offered himself as his squire. Carrasco armed himself in the fashion described, and Tom Seashell, that he might not be known by his gossip when they met, fitted on over his own natural nose the false masquerade one that has been mentioned, and so they followed the same route Don Quixote took, and almost came up with him in time to be present at the adventure of the cart of death and finally encountered them in the grove, where all that the sagacious reader has been reading about took place, and had it not been for the extraordinary fancies of Don Quixote and his conviction that the bachelor was not the bachelor, Senor Bachelor would have been incapacitated forever from taking his degree of licentiate, all through not finding nests where he thought to find birds. Tom Seashell, seeing how well they had succeeded, and what a sorry end their expedition had come to, said to the Bachelor, Sure enough, Senor Samson Carrasco, we're served. Don Quixote Chapter 15 483 it is easy enough to plan and set about an enterprise, but it is often a difficult matter to come well out of it. Don Quixote a madman and we sane, he goes off laughing, safe and sound, and you are left sore and sorry. I'd like to know now which is the matter, he who is so because he cannot help it, or he who is so of his own choice. To which Samson replied, the difference between the two sorts of madmen is, that he who is so will he nil he, will be one always, while he who is so of his own accord can leave off being one whenever he likes. In that case, said Tom Seashell, I was a madman of my own accord when I volunteered to become your squire, and, of my own accord, I'll leave off being one and go home. That's your affair, returned Samson, but to suppose that I am going home until I have given Don Quixote a thrashing is absurd, and it is not any wish that he may recover his senses that will make me hunt him out now, but a wish for the sore pain I am in with my ribs won't let me entertain more charitable thoughts. Thus discoursing, the pair proceeded until they reached a town where it was their good luck to find a bone minus setter, with whose help the unfortunate Samson was cured. Tom Seashell left him and went home, while he stayed behind meditating vengeance, and the history will return to him again at the proper time, so as not to omit making merry with Don Quixote now. Don Quixote Chapter 15 484 Chapter 16
Of what befell Don Quixote with a discreet gentleman? Of L.A. Mancha. Don Quixote pursued his journey in the high spirits, satisfaction, and self minus complacency already described, fancying himself the most valorous knight minus errant of the age in the world because of his late victory. All the adventures that could befall him from that time forth he regarded as already done and brought to a happy issue, he made light of enchantments and enchanters, he thought no more of the countless drubbings that had been administered to him in the course of his knight minus errantry, nor of the volley of stones that had leveled half his teeth, nor of the ingratitude of the galley slaves nor of the audacity of the Yangessens and the shower of stakes that fell upon him, in short, he said to himself that could he discover any means, mode, or way of disenchanting his lady Dulcinea, he would not envy the highest fortune that the most fortunate knight minus errant of your ever reached or could reach. He was going along entirely absorbed in these fancies, when Sancho said to him, Isn't it odd, senor, that I have still before my eyes that monstrous enormous nose of my gossip, Tom Seashell? And dost thou, then, believe, Sancho, said Don Quixote, that the Knight of the Mirrors was the bachelor Carrasco, and his squire Tom Seashell like gossip? I don't know what to say to that, replied Sancho. All I know is that the tokens he gave me about my own house, wife and children, nobody else but himself could have given me, and the face, once the nose was off, was the very face of Tom Seashell, as I have seen it many a time in my town and next door to my own house, and the sound of the voice was just the same. Let us reason the matter, Sancho, said Don Quixote. Come now, by what process of thinking can it be supposed that the bachelor Samson Carrasco would come as a knight minus errant, in arms offensive and defensive, to fight with me? Have I ever been by any chance his enemy? Have I ever given him any occasion to owe me a grudge? Am I his rival, or does he profess arms, that he should envy the fame I have acquired in them? Well, but what are we to say, senor, returned Sancho? about that knight, whoever he is, being so like the bachelor Carrasco, and his squire so like my gossip, Tom Seashell. And if that be enchantment, as your worship says, was there no other pair in the world for them to take the likeness of? Don Quixote Chapter 16 485 It is all, said Don Quixote, a scheme and plot of the malignant magicians that persecute me, who, foreseeing that I was to be victorious in the conflict, arranged that the vanquished knight should display the countenance of my friend the bachelor, in order that the friendship I bear him should interpose to stay the edge of my sword and might of my arm, and temper the just wrath of my heart, so that he who sought to take my life by fraud and falsehood should save his own. And to prove it, thou knowest already, Sancho, by experience which cannot lie or deceive, how easy it is for enchanters to change one countenance into another, turning fair into foul, and foul into fair, for it is not two days since thou sawest with thine own eyes the beauty and elegance of the peerless Dulcinea in all its perfection and natural harmony, while I saw her in the repulsive and mean form of a coarse country wench, with cataracts in her eyes and a foul smell in her mouth, and when the perverse enchanter ventured to effect so wicked a transformation, it is no wonder if he effected that of Samson Carrasco and thy gossip in order to snatch the glory of victory out of my grasp. For all that, however, I console myself, because, after all, in whatever shape he may have been, I have victorious over my enemy. God knows what's the truth of it all, said Sancho, and knowing as he did that the transformation of Dulcinea had been a device and imposition of his own, his master's illusions were not satisfactory to him, but he did not like to reply lest he should say something that might disclose his trickery. As they were engaged in this conversation they were overtaken by a man who was following the same road behind them, mounted on a very handsome flea minus bitten mare, and dressed in a goblin of fine green cloth, with tawny velvet facings, and a montera of the same velvet. The trappings of the mare were of the field and Janita fashion, and of mulberry color and green. He carried a Moorish cutlass hanging from a broad green and gold baldric, the buskins were of the same make as the baldric, the spurs were not gilt, but lacquered green, and so brightly polished that, matching as they did the rest of his apparel, they looked better than if they had been of pure gold. When the traveller came up with them he saluted them courteously, and spurring his mare was passing them without stopping, but Don Quixote called out to him, Gallant sir, if so be your worship is going our road, and has no occasion for speed, it would be a pleasure to me if we were to join company. In tr truth, replied he on the mare, I would not pass you so hastily, but for fear the horse might turn restive in the company of my mare. You may safely hold in your mare, senor, said Sancho in reply to this, for our horse is the most virtuous, and while minus behaved horse in the world, 
He never does anything wrong on such occasions, and the only time he misbehaved, my master, and I suffered for it sevenfold. I say again your worship may pull up if you like, for if she was offered to him between two plates the horse would not hanker after her. Don Quixote Chapter 16 486 The traveler drew rein, amazed at the trim and features of Don Quixote, who rode without his helmet, which Sancho carried like a valise in front of Dapple's pack minus saddle, and if the man in green examined Don Quixote closely, still more closely did Don Quixote examine the man in green, who struck him as being a man of intelligence. In appearance he was about fifty years of age, with but few gray hairs, an aquiline cast of features, and an expression between grave and gay, and his dress and accoutrements showed him to be a man of good condition. What he and Green thought of Don Quixote of La Mancha was that a man of that sort and shape he had never yet seen, he marveled at the length of his hair, his lofty stature, the lankness and sallowness of his countenance, his armor, his bearing, and his gravity minus a figure and picture such as had not been seen in those regions for many a long day. Don Quixote saw very plainly the attention with which the traveler was regarding him, and read his curiosity in his astonishment, and courteous as he was and ready to please everybody, before the other could ask him any question he anticipated him by saying, The appearance I present to your worship being so strange and so out of the common, I should not be surprised if it filled you with wonder. But you will cease to wonder when I tell you, as I do, that I am one of those knights who, as people say, go seeking adventures. I have left my home, I have mortgaged my estate, I have given up my comforts, and committed myself to the arms of fortune, to bear me whithersoever she may please. My desire was to bring to life again knight minus errantry, now dead, and for some time past, stumbling here, falling there, now coming down headlong, now raising myself up again, I have carried out a great portion. Of my design, succoring widows, protecting maidens, and giving aid to wives, orphans, and Miners, the proper and natural duty of knights minus errant, and, therefore, because of my many valiant and Christian achievements, I have been already found worthy to make my way in print to well minus nigh all, or most, of the nations of the earth. Thirty thousand volumes of my history have been printed, and it is on the high minus road to be printed thirty thousand thousands of times, if heaven does not put a stop to it. In short, to sum up all in a few words, or in a single one, I may tell you I am Don Quixote of La Mancha, otherwise called the Knight of the Rueful Countenance. For though self minus praise is degrading, I must perforce sound my own sometimes, that is to say, when there is no one at hand to do it for me. So that, gentle sir, neither this horse, nor this lance, nor this shield, nor this squire, nor all these arms put together, nor the sallowness of my countenance, nor my gauntliness, will henceforth astonish you, now that you know who I am and what profession I follow. With these words Don Quixote held his peace, and from the time he took to answer, the man in green seemed to be at a loss for a reply. After a long pause, however, he said to him, You were right when you saw curiosity in my amazement, Sir Knight, but you have not succeeded in removing the astonishment I feel at seeing you. For although you say, Senor, that knowing who you are ought to remove it, it is not done so, on the contrary. Now that I know, I am left more amazed and astonished. Then before. What? Is it possible that there are knights minus errant in the world in these days, and histories of real chivalry printed? I cannot realize the fact that there can be anyone on earth now minus a minus days who aids widows, or protects maidens, or defends wives, or suckers orphans, nor should I believe it had I not seen it in. Don Quixote Chapter 16 487 Your worship with my own eyes. Blessed be heaven. For by means of this history of your noble and genuine chivalrous deeds, which you say has been printed, the countless stories of fictitious knights minus errant with which the world is filled, so much to the injury of morality, and the prejudice and discredit of good histories, will have been driven into oblivion. There is a good deal to be said on that point, said Don Quixote, as to whether the histories of the knights minus errant are fiction or not. Why, is there anyone who doubts that those histories are false, said the man in green. I doubt it, said Don Quixote, but never mind that just now, if our journey lasts long enough, I trust in God I shall show your worship that you do wrong in going with the stream of those who regard it as a matter of certainty that they are not true. From this last observation of Don Quixote's, the traveler began to have a suspicion that he was some crazy being and was waiting him to confirm it by something further, but before they could turn to any new subject Don Quixote begged him to tell him who he was, since he himself had rendered account of his station in life. To this, he and the green Gavon replied I, Sir Knight of the Rueful Countenance, am a gentleman by birth, native of the village where, please God, we are going to dine today, I am more than fairly well off, 
and my name is Don Diego de Miranda. I pass my life with my wife, children, and friends. My pursuits are hunting and fishing, but I keep neither hawks nor greyhounds, nothing but a tame partridge or a bold ferret or two. I have six dozen or so of books, some in our mother tongue, some Latin, some of them history, others devotional, those of chivalry have not as yet crossed the threshold of my door. I am more given to turning over the profane than the devotional, so long as they are books of honest entertainment that charm by their style and attract an interest by the invention they display, though of these there are very few in Spain. Sometimes I dine with my neighbors and friends, and often invite them, my entertainments are neat and well served without stint of anything. I have no taste for tattle, nor do I allow tattling in my presence. I pry not into my neighbors' lives, nor have I links minus eyes for what others do. I hear mass every day, I share my substance with the poor, making no display of good works, lest I let hypocrisy and vainglory, those enemies that subtly take possession of the most watchful heart, find an entrance into mine. I strive to make peace between those whom I know to be at variance, I am the devoted servant of Our Lady, and my trust is ever in the infinite mercy of God our Lord. Sancho listened with the greatest attention to the account of the gentleman's life and occupation, and thinking it a good and a holy life, and that he who led it ought to work miracles, he threw himself off Dapple, and running in haste seized his right stirrup and kissed his foot again and again with a devout heart and almost with tears. Seeing this the gentleman asked him, What are you about, brother? What are these kisses for? Don Quixote Chapter 16 488 Let me kiss, said Sancho, for I think your worship is the first saint in the saddle I ever saw all the days of my life. I am no saint, replied the gentleman, but a great sinner, but you are, brother, for you must be a good fellow, as your simplicity shows. Sancho went back and regained his pack minus saddle, having extracted a laugh from his master's profound melancholy, and excited fresh amazement in Don Diego. Don Quixote then asked him how many children he had, and observed that one of the things wherein the ancient philosophers, who were without the true knowledge of God, placed the summum bonum was in the gifts of nature, in those of fortune, in having many friends, and many in good children. I, Senor Don Quixote, answered the gentleman, have one son, without whom, perhaps, I should count myself happier than I am, not because he is a bad son, but because he is not so good as I could wish. He is eighteen years of age, he has been for six at Salamanca studying Latin and Greek, and when I wished him to turn to the study of other sciences I found him so wrapped up in that of poetry, if that can be called a science, that there is no getting him to take kindly to the law, which I wished him to study, or to theology, the queen of them all. I would like him to be an honor to his family, as we live in days when our kings liberally reward learning that is virtuous and worthy, for learning without virtue is a pearl on a dunghill. He spends the whole day in settling whether Homer expressed himself correctly or not in such, and such a line of the Iliad, whether Marshall was indecent or not in such and such an epigram, whether such and such lines of Virgil are to be understood. In this way or in that, in short, all his talk is of the works of these poets, and those of Horace, Perseus, Juvenal, and Tibullus, for of the moderns in our own language he makes no great account, but with all his seeming indifference to Spanish poetry, just now his thoughts are absorbed in making a gloss on four lines that have been sent him from Salamanca, which I suspect are for some poetical tournament. To all this Don Quixote said in reply, Children, senor, are portions of their parents' bowels, and therefore, be they good or bad, are to be loved as we love the soul that give us life, it is for the parents to guide them from infancy in the ways of virtue, propriety, and worthy Christian conduct, so that when grown up they may be the staff of their parents' old age, and the glory of their posterity, and to force them to study this or that science I do not think wise, though it may be no. Harm to persuade them, and when there is no need to study for the sake of pain lucrando, and it is the student's good fortune that heaven has given him parents who provide him with it, it would be my advice to them to let him pursue whatever science they may see him most inclined to, and though that of poetry is less useful than pleasurable, it is not one of those that bring discredit upon the possessor. Poetry, gentle sir, is, as I take it, like a tender young maiden of supreme beauty, to array, bedeck, and adorn. Whom is the task of several other maidens, who are all the rest of the sciences, and she must avail herself of the help of all, and all derive their luster from her. But this maiden will not. Don Quixote Chapter 16 489 Bear to be handled, nor dragged through the streets, nor exposed either at the corners of the market minus places, or in the closets of palaces. She is the product of an alchemy of such virtue that he who is able to practice it, 
will turn her into pure gold of inestimable worth. He that possesses her must keep her within bounds, not permitting her to break out in ribald satires or soulless sonnets. She must on no account be offered for sale, unless, indeed, it be in heroic poems, moving tragedies, or sprightly and ingenious comedies. She must not be touched by the buffoons, nor by the ignorant vulgar, incapable of comprehending or appreciating her hidden treasures. And do not suppose, senor, that I apply the term vulgar here merely to plebeians and the lower orders, for everyone who is ignorant, be he lord or prince, may and should be included among the vulgar. He, then, who shall embrace and cultivate poetry under the conditions I have named, shall become famous, and his name honored throughout all the civilized nations of the earth. And with regard to what you say, Senor, of your son having no great opinion of Spanish poetry, I am inclined to think that he is not quite right there, and for this reason, the great poet Homer did not write in Latin, because he was a Greek, nor did Virgil write in Greek, because he was a Latin, in short, all the ancient poets wrote in the language they imbibed with their mother's milk, and never went in quest of foreign ones to express their sublime conceptions, and that being so, the usage should in justice extend to all nations, and the German poet should not be undervalued, because he writes in his own language, nor the Castilian, nor even the Biscayan, for writing in his. But your son, senor, I suspect, is not prejudiced against Spanish poetry, but against those poets who are mere Spanish verse writers, without any knowledge of other languages or sciences to adorn and give life and vigor to their natural inspiration, and yet even in this. He may be wrong, for, according to a true belief, a poet is born one, that is to say, the poet. By nature comes forth a poet from his mother's womb, and following the bent that heaven has bestowed upon him, without the aid of study or art, he produces things that show how truly he spoke who said, S. Deus in nobis, at the same time, I say that the poet by nature who calls an art to his aid will be a far better poet, and will surpass him who tries to be one relying upon his knowledge of art alone. The reason is, that art does not surpass nature, but only brings it to perfection, and thus, nature combined with art, and art with nature, will produce a perfect poet. To bring my argument to a close, I would say then, gentle sir, let your son go on as his star leads him, for being so studious as he seems to be, and having already successfully surmounted the first step of the sciences, which is that of the languages, with their help he will by his own exertions reach the summit of polite literature, which so well becomes an independent gentleman and adorns, honors, and distinguishes him as much as the mitre does the bishop or the gown the learned counselor. If your son writes satires reflecting on the honor of others, chide and correct him, and tear them up, but if he composed discourses in which he rebukes vice in general, in the style of Horace, and with elegance like his, commend him, for it is legitimate for a poet to write against envy and lash the envious in his verse, and the other vices too, provided he does not single out individuals, there are, however, poets who, for the sake of saying something spiteful, would run the risk of being banished to the coast of Pontus. If the poet be pure in his morals, he will be pure in his verses too, the pen is the tongue of the mind, and is the thought engendered there, so will be the things that it writes down. And when kings and princes observe this marvelous Don Quixote Chapter 16 490 Science of poetry in wise, virtuous, and thoughtful subjects, they honor, value, exalt them, and even crown them with the leaves of that tree which the thunderbolt strikes not, as if to show that they whose brows are honored and adorned with such a crown are not to be assailed by anyone. He of the Green Goblin was filled with astonishment at Don Quixote's argument, so much so that he began to abandon the notion he had taken up about his being crazy. But in the middle of the discourse, it being not very much to his taste, Sancho had turned aside out of the road to beg a little milk from some shepherds, who were milking their ewes hard by, and just as the gentleman, highly pleased, was about to renew the conversation, Don Quixote, raising his head, perceived a cart covered with royal flags coming along the road they were traveling, and persuaded that this must be some new adventure. He called aloud to Sancho to come and bring him his helmet. Sancho, hearing himself called, quitted the shepherds, and, prodding Dapple vigorously, came up to his master, to whom there fell a terrific and desperate adventure. Don Quixote Chapter 16 491 Chapter 17 Wherein is shown the furthest and highest point which the unexampled courage of Don Quixote reached or could reach, together with the happily achieved adventure of the lions. The history tells that when Don Quixote called out to Sancho to bring him his helmet, Sancho was buying some curds the shepherds agreed to sell him, 
and flurried by the great haste his master was in did not know what to do with them or what to carry them in, so, not to lose them, for he had already paid for them, he thought it best to throw them into his master's helmet, and acting on this bright idea he went to see what his master wanted with him. He, as he approached, exclaimed to him, Give me that helmet, my friend, for either I know little of adventures, or what I observe yonder is one that will, and does, call upon me to arm myself. He of the green gavan, on hearing this, looked in all directions, but could perceive nothing, except a cart coming towards them with two or three small flags, which led him to conclude it must be carrying treasure of the kings, and he said so to Don Quixote. He, however, would not believe him, being always persuaded and convinced that all that happened to him must be adventures and still more adventures, so he replied to the gentleman, he who is prepared has his battle half fought, nothing is lost by my preparing myself, for I know by experience that I have enemies, visible and invisible, and I know not when, or where, or at what moment, or in what shapes they will attack me. And turning to Sancho he called for his helmet, and Sancho, as he had no time to take out the curds, had to give it just as it was. Don Quixote took it, and without perceiving what was in it thrust it down in hot haste upon his head, but as the curds were pressed and squeezed the way, began to run all over his face and beard, whereat he was so startled that he cried out to Sancho. Sancho, what's this? I think my head is softening, or my brains are melting, or I am sweating from head to foot. If I am sweating it is not indeed from fear. I am convinced beyond a doubt that the adventure which is about to befall me is a terrible one. Give me something to wipe myself with, if thou hast it, for this profuse sweat is blinding me. Sancho held his tongue and gave him a cloth, and gave thanks to God at the same time that his master had not found out what was the matter. Don Quixote then wiped himself, and took off his helmet to see what it was that made his head feel so cool, and seeing all that white mash inside his helmet he put it to his nose, and as soon as he had smelt it he. Don Quixote Chapter 17 492 Exclaimed By the life of my lady Dulcinea del Toboso, but it is curds thou hast put here, thou treacherous, impudent, ill minus mannered squire. To which, with great composure and pretended innocence, Sancho replied, If they are curds let me have them, your worship, and I'll eat them, but let the devil eat them, for it must have been he who put them there. I dare to dirty your helmet. You have guessed the offender finely. Faith, sir, by the light God gives me, it seems I must have enchanters too, that persecute me as a creature, and limb of your worship and they must have put that nastiness there in order to provoke your patience to anger, and make you baste my ribs as you are wont to do. Well this time, indeed, they have missed their aim, for I trust to my master's good sense to see that I have got no curds or milk, or anything of the sort, and that if I had it is in my stomach I would put it, and not in the helmet. May he so, said Don Quixote. All this the gentleman was observing, and with astonishment, more especially when, after having wiped himself clean, his head, face, beard, and helmet, Don Quixote put it on, and settling himself firmly in his stirrups, easing his sword in the scabbard and grasping his lance, he cried, Now, come who will, here am I, ready to try conclusions with Satan himself in person. By this time the cart with the flags had come up, unattended by anyone except the carter on a mule, and a man sitting in front. Don Quixote planted himself before it and said, Whither are you going, brothers? What cart is this? What have you got in it? What flags are those? To this the carter replied, The cart is mine. What is in it is a pair of wild-caged lions, which the governor of Oran is sending to court as a present to his majesty, and the flags are our lord the king's, to show that what is here is his property. And are the lions large? asked Don Quixote. So large, replied the man who sat at the door of the cart, that larger, or as large, have never crossed from Africa to Spain. I am the keeper, and I have brought over others, but never any like these. They are male and female, the male is in that first cage, and the female in the one behind, and they are hungry now, for they have eaten nothing to minus day. So let your worship stand aside, for we must make haste to the place where we are to feed them. Hereupon, smiling slightly, Don Quixote exclaimed, Lion minus whelps to me. To me whelps of lions, and at such a time. Then, by God, those gentlemen who send them here shall see if I am a man to be frightened by lions. Get down, my good fellow, and as you are the keeper open the cages, and turn me out those beasts, and in the midst of this plain, I will let them know who Don Quixote of La Mancha is, in spite and in the teeth of the enchanters. Don Quixote Chapter 17 493 Who send them to me? 
So, so, said the gentleman to himself at this. Our worthy knight has shown of what sort he is. The Kurds, no doubt, have softened his skull and brought his brains to a head. At this instant Sancho came up to him, saying, Senor, for God's sake do something to keep my master, Don Quixote, from tackling these lions, for if he does they'll tear us all to pieces here. Is your master then so mad, asked the gentleman, that you believe and are afraid he will engage such fierce animals? He is not mad, said Sancho, but he is venturesome. I will prevent it, said the gentleman, and going over to Don Quixote, who was insisting upon the keepers opening the cages, he said to him, Sir Knight, Knights minus errant should attempt adventures which encourage the hope of a successful issue, not those which entirely withhold it. For valor that trenches upon temerity savors rather of madness than of courage. Moreover, these lions do not come to oppose you, nor do they dream of such a thing, they are going as presents to his majesty. And it will not be right to stop them or delay their journey. Gentle sir, replied Don Quixote, you go and mind your tame partridge and your bold ferret, and leave everyone to manage his own business. This is mine, and I know whether these gentlemen the lions come to me or not, and then turning to the keeper he exclaimed, by all that's good, sir scoundrel, if you don't open the cages this very instant, I'll pin you to the cart with this lance. The carter, seeing the determination of this apparition in armor, said to him, Please your worship, for charity's sake, senor, let me unyoke the mules and place myself in safety along with them before the lions are turned out, for if they kill them on me I am ruined for life, for all I possess is this cart and mules. O man of little faith, replied Don Quixote, get down and unyoke, you will soon see that you are exerting yourself for nothing, and that you might have spared yourself the trouble. The carter got down and with all speed unyoked the mules, and the keeper called out at the top of his voice, I call all here to witness that against my will and under compulsion I open the cages and let the lions loose, and that I warn this gentleman that he will be accountable for all the harm and mischief which these beasts may do, and for my salary and dues as well. You, gentlemen, place yourselves in safety before I open, for I know they will do me no harm. Don Quixote Chapter 17 494 Once more the gentleman strove to persuade Don Quixote not to do such a mad thing, as it was tempting God to engage in such a piece of folly. To this, Don Quixote replied that he knew what he was about. The gentleman in return entreated him to reflect, for he knew he was under a delusion. Well, senor, answered Don Quixote, if you do not like to be a spectator of this tragedy, as in your opinion it will be, spur your flea minus bitten mare, and place yourself in safety. Hearing this, Sancho with tears in his eyes entreated him to give up an enterprise compared with which the one of the windmills, and the awful one of the fulling mills, and in fact, all the feats he had attempted in the whole course of his life, were cakes and fancy bread. Look ye, senor, said Sancho, there's no enchantment here, nor anything of the sort, for between the bars and chinks of the cage, I have seen the paw of a real lion, and judging by that I reckon the lion such a paw could belong to must be bigger than a mountain. Fear at any rate, replied Don Quixote, will make him look bigger to thee than half the world. Retire, Sancho, and leave me, and if I die here thou knowest our old compact, thou wilt repair to Dulcinea Minus I say no more. To these he added some further words that banished all hope of his giving up his insane project. He of the Green Goblin would have offered resistance, but he found himself ill Minus matched as to arms, and did not think it prudent to come to blows with a madman, for such Don Quixote now showed himself to be in every respect, and the latter, renewing his commands to the keeper and repeating his threats, gave warning to the gentleman to spur his mare, Sancho his dapple, and the carter his mules all striving to get away from the cart as far as they could before the lions broke loose. Sancho was weeping over his master's death, for this time he firmly believed it was in store for him. From the claws of the lions, and he cursed his fate and called it an unlucky hour when he thought of taking service with him again, but with all his tears and lamentations he did not forget to thrash Dapple so as to put a good space between himself and the cart. The keeper, seeing that the fugitives were now some distance off, once more entreated and warned him as before, but he replied that he heard him, and that he need not trouble himself with any further warnings or entreaties, as they would be fruitless, and bade him make haste. During the delay that occurred while the keeper was opening the first cage, Don Quixote was considering whether it would not be well to do battle on foot, instead of on horseback, and finally resolved to fight on foot, fearing that Rocinante might take fright at the sight of the lions. He therefore sprang off his horse, flung his lance aside, braced his buckler on his arm, and drawing his sword, advanced slowly with marvelous intrepidity and resolute courage to plant himself in front of 
the cart, commending himself with all his heart to God and to his lady Dulcinea. Don Quixote Chapter 17 495 It is to be observed, that on coming to this passage, the author of this voracious history breaks out into exclamations. O doughty Don Quixote! High minus metal past extolling! Mirror, wherein all the heroes of the world may see themselves! Second modern Don Manuel de Leon, once the glory and honor of Spanish knighthood. In what words shall I describe this dread exploit, by what language shall I make it credible to ages to come, what eulogies are there unmeet for thee, though they be hyperboles piled on hyperboles? On foot, alone, undaunted, high minus sold, with but a simple sword, and that no trenchant blade of the Perillo brand, a shield, but no bright polished steel one, there stoodst thou, biting and awaiting the two fiercest lions that Africa's forests ever bred. Thy own deeds be thy praise, valiant Manchagan, and here I leave them as they stand, wanting the words wherewith to glorify them. Here the author's outburst came to an end, and he proceeded to take up the thread of his story, saying that the keeper, seeing that Don Quixote had taken up his position, and that it was impossible for him to avoid letting out the mail without incurring the enmity of the fiery and daring knight, flung open the doors of the first cage, containing, as has been said, the lion, which was now seen to be of enormous size, and grim and hideous mien. The first thing he did was to turn round in the cage in which he lay, and protrude his claws, and stretch himself thoroughly. He next opened his mouth, and yawned very leisurely, and with near two palms length of tongue that he had thrust forth, he licked the dust out of his eyes and washed his face. Having done this, he put his head out of the cage and looked all round with eyes like glowing coals, a spectacle and demeanor to strike terror into temerity itself. Don Quixote merely observed him steadily, longing for him to leap from the cart and come to close quarters with him when he hoped to hew him in pieces. So far did his unparalleled madness go, but the noble lion, more courteous than arrogant, not troubling himself about silly bravado, after having looked all round, as has been said, turned about and presented his hind minus quarters to Don Quixote, and very coolly and tranquilly lay down again in the cage. Seeing this, Don Quixote ordered the keeper to take a stick to him, and provoke him to make him come out. That I won't, said the keeper, for if I anger him, the first he'll tear in pieces will be myself. Be satisfied, sir knight, with what you have done, which leaves nothing more to be said on the score of courage, and do not seek to tempt fortune a second time. The lion has the door open, he is free to come out or not to come out, but as he has not come out so far, he will not come out to minus day. Your worship's great courage has been fully manifested already, no brave champion, so it strikes me, is bound to do more than challenge his enemy and wait for him on the field. If his adversary does not come, on him lies the disgrace, and he who waits for him carries off the crown of victory. That is true, said Don Quixote. Close the door, my friend, and let me have, in the best form thou canst, what thou hast seen me do, by way of certificate, to wit, that thou didst open for the lion, that I waited for him, that he did not come out, that I still waited for him, 